Witam bardzo serdecznie Państwa na dzisiejszej porządku komunistycznej. It's really a pleasure to invite you to the Polo Terminal Science Colloquium. Today's guest is Professor Costello uh, with the Buddhist from Texas. Greg will introduce him and then we'll have a lecture. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, today we are delighted to welcome Dr. Hoffman with the Buddhist, who is a professor of philosophy and associate fellow for strategic planning at Texas AM University. Former, former. Former associate provost, now retired. Should we congratulate him? Yes. Congratulations. <laughs> uh, where he was previously the sixth dean of College of Liberal Arts. Before joining Texas AM in 2010, he served as a professor of philosophy, director of the Center for Programs in Arts and Sciences, and director of the Philosophy and Neuroscience Psychology Program at Washington University in St. Louis. Born in Bogota, Colombia. Uh, Bermudez earned his MA and PhD in philosophy from King's College, Cambridge University. He began his academic career at the University of Cambridge before joining the faculty at the University of Stirling in Scotland, where he served as department chair. Mm, in the classroom, Dr. Bermudez has offered courses in a wide range of areas, including philosophy of mind, the history of philosophy and mathematical logic. Dr. Bermudez has more than 100 publications, including five single author books, and six edited volumes. His research, research interests are interdisciplinary in nature at the intersection of philosophy, psychology, and neuroscience. Uh, his first book, The Paradox of Self-Consciousness, published by MIT Press, analyzed the nature of self-awareness. Thinking without words uh, offered a model for thinking about the cognitive achievements and abilities of pre-linguistic infants and non-linguistic humans. His most recent monograph, Decision Theory and Rationality, explores tensions in how the concept of rationality is defined and formalized in different academic disciplines. The second edition of his textbook, Cognitive Science and Introduction to the Science of Mind, was published by Cambridge University Press in March 2014. He remains an active researcher and he is the editor of the New Problems in Philosophy book series, published by Rutledge. Current projects include papers in the philosophy of mind and language, and the theory, theory of rationality. Uh, and today we have a unique opportunity to listen to Professor Bermuda's lecture entitled Ownership in the Space of the Body. We're very happy to have you here. Thank you. Thanks very much, Greg, for that kind welcome. Thanks very much, Sebastian, for helping bring me here. It's, it's a real pleasure to be in Krakow. Can I just check that you can hear me at the back? Can you wave if you can mm -hmm. hear me? Good deal. Yeah, it's a real pleasure, and I really appreciate so many of you coming this afternoon to listen. I know it's a very busy time of the semester, so, so thank you, I hope. Hope you'll be, uh, hope you'll be rewarded, if not, if not on this earth, then perhaps on the next one. So I want to talk about the awareness of the body. And I want to start off with some experiments that have really framed discussion in this area. The so-called rubber hand illusion and also the full body illusion and the body swap illusion. Because what I want to say is, is intersects with some of the experimental literature here, I think, in interesting ways. So the rubber hand illusion, which you may have, you, which you may have come across as an extremely robust illusion, where subjects are presented with a rubber hand that they know is not their hand, they, their hand is hidden, and their hand is simultaneously stroked at the same time as they see the rubber hand being stroked. And what happens, it's a very, robust, a very robust result, is that people say they start identifying with the rubber hand. They think that the rubber hand is their own hand. Well, they say they think the rubber hand is their own hand. They obviously know that it's not, because it's a, it's a rubber hand. That, that, um, that paradigm was developed in 1998. Since then, there's been just an enormous explosion of, of research on the rubber hand, but also on some other interesting bodily illusions. Here are two of them. The, uh, the full body illusion and the body swap illusion. So what's interesting about these experiments is that they use virtual, virtual reality. So you have a subject who's lying on, on, on their back. They're looking at this virtual reality thing. And what they see in front of them is, is, a, is a mannequin 
a kind of model person, and they see that model person being touched in the middle of their back. And at the same time as they see the person being touched in the middle of the back, they're themselves being touched in their own back. So what happens, and again this is really robust, is that people start to identify with the mannequin in front of them, say that you know they are, they feel themselves to be in that body that they, at one level, know perfectly well is not is not theirs. And then over here, this is this is kind of a third person illusion. So you you identify with someone from the outside looking in. If you could tell that lady at the back that there's actually a seat at the front if she wants to come in. Then on this one, the this is a first person illusion. So the subject is having their stomach tickled, kind of like a cat, and at the same time they see a mannequin kind of in the, in the same kind of position that, 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 that they would be in if they were looking down, their, looking down their, own, their own bodies. And again, you get the same, the same result here. People start to think that they are in fact the person that they they can they can see that they, they start to project themselves into this into this patently false position. So these are kind of interesting. I think they're interesting in themselves, but I think they're more interesting because they point to a they they point us towards they, they give us a way of operationalizing something that within philosophy and within cognitive science we've only really been able to study either through first-person phenomenology, or through looking at really pathological cases, like patients with very distorted awareness of their own body in neuropsychological disorders like spatial neglect, where patients can't recognize the fact that they, that they, they sort of ignore all stimuli on their, on their left-hand side, including the left-hand side of their bodies. So what the rubber hand illusion and these illusions give us is a kind of nice, tractable way of exploring in normal subjects how we experience our own bodies and the kind of things that make us say that a limb belongs to us, this is my hand, or this is my body. And this is, this is really what I want to talk about. I want to talk about the sense of ownership. What makes it the case that you experience your body as your own? And just autobiographically, I, I wrote about this some years ago, many years ago, too many years ago, um, 20 years ago or something, before any of this stuff ar arose. And I made a proposal for how we think about the, um, how we experience our bodies. And Mirabile Dicta, it turns out that the, uh, the account I developed then is actually interestingly, sheds an interesting perspective, I think, on these, on these experiments. So what people tend to talk about in the, this is, should be RHI, rubber hand illusion. I have a personal illusion that leads me to confuse an H with a B, so I'm sorry about that. The RHI and the whole body illusions are typically discussed as illusions of ownership. And if you look at the experimental literature, you'll see people writing a lot about the sense of ownership, the experience of ownership. Unfortunately, what they typically mean by ownership is what we discover in the rubber hand illusion and in the whole body illusions. And from my point of view as a philosopher interested in cognitive science, I'd rather have a more worked out and precise understanding of what, of what that phenomenon is. And that's really what I want to talk about today. I want to talk about the, the pre-theoretical or people sometimes call pre-reflective sense of ownership, or the experience that you have of your body as your own body. What time did we start? Just two minutes ago, that's fine. Yeah. <laughs> About five. About five, all right. I'll be, I'll be mindful. If you could, when, I, when I'm talking for too long, just stop me. So I want to talk about this because it's unclear to me what exactly is being operationalized in the rubber hand illusion. And I also want to start thinking about ownership in a way that allows, that makes sense of the fact that we have ownership, we experience our bodies as our own, and we experience parts of our bodies as our own. I want to give an, an account that ties those things together, because 
intuitively they don't have a whole bunch in common. So, Frédéric de Vignemont, a philosopher and cognitive scientist based in France, has written quite a lot about ownership, and I was talking to her the other day, and she says she no longer believes this, but she wrote it, so I'm still going to continue to quote it. So what she said in 2013 is, we experience our bodies as our own in virtue of a felt minus that goes over and beyond the mere experience of one's bodily properties. So what she says and what a number of other people have, have suggested is that there's a specific feeling of ownership, like a quale that you have that tells you that your hand is your own or your, your body is your own. And I think that there are ways of reading Husserl and ways of reading Merleau-Ponty on which this is what they also, this is what they also believe. And I'm not going to talk about it here, but I think that this is probably false. And even if it were true, it wouldn't help really elucidate the phenomenon that, that, that we're talking about. It doesn't seem to me that there is a distinctive feeling of ownership. But we can maybe talk about that in the, in the discussion. What I want to do is something more, kind of more, more pedestrian in a way. What we see in the rubber hand illusion and in the whole body illusion are judgments. People make judgments. This is my hand. That, that, I feel that that rubber hand is my hand. So I just want to start with those judgments and ask what are those judgments based on? And based on here can mean one of two things, can mean two different things, and I want to try and tackle both of them. In one sense, kind of a causal sense, based on means emerging from, it means how it's, how it's caused, how it's generating, what's the representational structure that gives rise to judgments of ownership? What's the, what are the mechanics of how we experience our bodies? But there's also a kind of more normative component that I also want to address, which is how are our judgments of ownership justified? What gives them evidential support? What evidence are they based on? From the first person perspective, what is it that justifies me when I say, I experience this hand as mine, or I experience this body as mine? So I think you can take a number of different views here, but I think that there are probably three Three principal ones. You can look at judgments of agency and see them as based on either where you experience bodily sensations. So the idea is that you experience a body part as your own if you have sensations in it. You experience your body as your own because your body is the locus of sensation. Or you can ground ownership in the experience of agency. So you experience a hand as your own because you act with it, because you can act with it. Your body is the locus of, your body is the locus of agency. And I'm gonna talk about those two briefly because I think that there's considerable truth in them, but they are not fundamental. Both of them, what's important about the experience location of agents, of sensation, what's important about the experience of agency is that they point us to something very distinctive about how we experience space within our body. So I know that there are many cognitive scientists here, so let me just say a little bit about how this fits into discussions of space in, in cognitive science. I mean, as, as, as you know, there's been considerable discussion about cognitive maps, different sorts of frames of reference, egocentric frames of reference, allocentric frames of reference, how we and how animals represent space. There hasn't been a whole lot of discussion, in fact I'd say almost zero, of how we represent the space inside our bodies as opposed to how we represent the space outside. So I want to extend the conversation in, in, in a slightly new direction. And that's going to be the main focus of my, 
of, of my talk, and I'll be talking about some of the parallels, some of the analogies, but also some of the disanalogies between how we represent space externally and how we represent space internally. But let me start off by talking about sensations and ownership, and this idea that what grounds our judgments of ownership is the fact that we experience sensations within, within the bounds of the body. This is a pretty, pretty venerable view. I, I couldn't find it in the Greeks, but I could certainly find it in, in John Locke. His essay concerning human understanding, he writes, Our thinking conscious self extends to all parts of the body that we feel when they are touched and are affected by and conscious of good or harm that happens to them. So Locke's idea is ownership, what we feel to be ourselves, what we take to be ourselves, body-wise, is coextensive with the, the, the parts of the body that we're concerned with that we care about and that we feel sensations in. So his thesis, the body is experienced as the locus of sensations and judgments of ownership follow the localization of sensations. Sensations here, pain, pleasure, itches, senses of joint movement, proprioception, all of the bodily, all of the bodily experiences that we have touch as well. So I think that this is clearly important, but can't be the whole account of what grounds our judgments of agency. For one thing, sensation is not sufficient for judgments of ownership. So there's a disorder called somatoparaphrenia, where brain damaged patients deny ownership of their limbs. So they'll look at their arms, this is not my arm. I have real, some real cognitive dissonance about this. But they'll still say there is no arm here. But nonetheless, they'll report feeling sensations inside the arm that they say is not theirs. So this would seem to be a case where they have sensations, but not judgments of ownership. So something strange is going, going on there. And let me remind you also that those experiments we started off with, the rubber hand illusion, the full body illusion, the body swap illusion, some of those can be induced without sensations. So the rubber, the rubber hand illusion involves stroking. The hand is stroked and your, invisible, your hidden hand is stroked at the same time, and that synchronous stroking is what leads you in some sense, to project yourself into the rubber hand. But you can get the rubber hand illusion without any sensations, which is kind of cool. You can get people to project concern for the, for the rubber hand by approaching it in the right sort of, in the right sort of way. So I can, if anyone's interested, I, can, I have a better reference than that for, for, for that work. So let me look at the second view, agency. So the idea here is that ownership, experiencing our bodies as our own, is a function of the fact that we act through our bodies, that our bodies are the locus of action. And again, obviously, there's something really fundamental here in the very distinctive relationship that we have to our own bodies. Is very importantly a function of ourself as a, as a potentiality, potentiality for action. Again, this is something that we read a lot about in, in Husserl or in Merleau-Ponty or other writers in the phenomenological tradition. But I think there are a couple of reasons that make me think that this can't be the whole story. The first one is this is really not all that dissimilar from the first view, because our experience of agency is very much sensation-based. When we talk about action awareness, our awareness of our actions, that's partly an awareness of sensations in the body parts that we're moving with. 
that we are that, that we're moving kinesthetic, proprioceptive receptors in, in the joints and in the muscles and so on. And again, going back to the, I can't understand why I keep getting this B here. Going back to the rubber hand illusion and the full body illusions, there's no agency. You can generate the illusion with active movement, without sensation, without sensory stimulation, but that's not the standard way of doing it. So you can get all these illusions of ownership without agency, suggesting that agency can't be the whole story. So what I want to do in the rest of the the rest of the, the presentation is try and look for something that's more, more basic, more fundamental than the experience location of sensations and the experience of, of agency. And I want to go back to something that is stressed in Descartes' sixth meditation that we find keep coming up in the, in the history of, of philosophy, which is the the fact that we have a very distinctive form of experience of our own bodies. And really I think that's the, that's the main, that's the main reason why philosophers have been very interested in trying to understand proprioception and the sense of touch and other forms of, of bodily awareness because it, in some sense that gives us a perceptual, a perceptual access to ourselves as physical objects that we don't have to any other type of physical objects, to any other type of object in the world. So when Descartes says we're not in our bodies as a pilot is in his ship, one of the ways of understanding that is that we have, access, we have modes of access, ways of finding out our body, about our bodies that we don't have to anything else. So here's the working hypothesis that I'm going to develop with. What's really important, I think, the hypothesis, what's really important in how we experience our bodies is the way in which we experience space, the way in which we experience the, the location of events inside our bodies. So I think this is what really marks bodily awareness out from other kinds of outward-directed perception. There's a very basic difference between how space is represented inside the body and how it's represented outside the body. Somewhere in the phenomenology of perception, Merleau Ponty says that the boundaries of the body present a limit that ordinary spatial relations do not cross. And I think there's something very interesting and suggestive about that. And really, you can see the rest of this talk as a, as a free association on that sentence, kind of a free association on that sentence, there's a little bit of structure to it. And I want to emphasize that I think the distinctive spatiality of the body grounds those other two forms of experience. It grounds the way in which we experience our <coughs> sensations and also how we experience ourselves as capable, for action, cap capable of action. So, some housekeeping. So bodily events I'm taking to be sensations, tactile experiences through the sense of touch, proprioception, kinesthesis, our sense of bodily movement when your arm is flexed or straightened. And I want to say that when we experience these bodily events, that experience has two very general features, which I'll call boundedness and connectedness. And what, I want, what I'm going to do is talk very generally about boundedness and connectedness and then present a model that will, a model of first person bodily experience and how, how it represents space, what the frame of reference is, that captures boundedness and connectedness. And then I want to give you some indications as how we can use some work from robotics and biomechanics and from the theory of object perception to flesh that, flesh that model out. So, something for everyone. 
So boundaries. Bodily events are experienced within a body shape volume whose boundaries define the limits of the self. Now I think this is not as obvious as it sounds. The point is that whenever we experience an event, leaving aside cases like somatoparaphrenia, we experience it as within our bodies and within our experience body. But our experience body can be different from the real body. So there are a number of cases where the experience body is larger than the real body. When there are regions of space that are not inhabited by the body that are still experienced as if the body extended to them. So phantom limb is an example. So amputees very reliably, or a significant percentage of amputees report having a very strong illusion that the amputated limb is still a part of them and they experience sensations out in the in what's really empty space, but that they experience as being a continuation of their of their body, the old the old bodily space. And there's very interesting work in the design of prosthes prosthetics, artificial limbs, where a paradigm for constructing prostheses based around the idea of extended physiological proprioception has creates in amputees a sense of ownership for their prostheses and also a projection of sensations into the prosthetic limb. I can talk more about that in the, in, in the, in the discussion. It's not widely known in, in, in philosophy and cognitive science. It was, I found it in, in uh, some, some journals, some journals on, on, on prostheses. Developed by a guy called DC Simpson in the 1970s. So you can have the experienced body being larger than the real body, but you can also have it being smaller. So I've already talked about somatoparaphrenia, but unilateral spatial neglect is also an example of the body, the experienced body being smaller than the, than the actual body, because neglect patients will neglect all stimuli on the side of their body that is on the opposite side from where they had the, had the brain damage. So you'll see men with unilateral spatial neglect will shave themselves but only on one half of their, one half of their face. Or patients will only get dressed on one, one side of their body. So their experienced body is smaller than the, than the real body. So the second feature that I want to emphasize is what I call connectedness. And the idea here is that the spatial location of a bodily event is experienced relative to the disposition of the body as a whole. So if you have a pain in your knee, so you experience that pain not just in your knee but also in your leg, and your leg being at a certain angle relative to your torso, and your torso is at a certain angle relative to supporting surfaces, the floor, and to, and to gravity. So this is not the same as boundedness. You can't have connectedness without boundedness, but you can have boundedness without connectedness. So it seems to me that both boundedness and connectedness throw out predictions that are supported by some of the literature on bodily illusions. So for example, if boundedness is correct, then you experience events in body parts within the space of your own bodies. So if you experience a stroking sensation in a rubber hand, you would expect that that rubber hand to be incorporated into your awareness of your own body, to be experienced as a part of your own body. So you would expect subjects in rubber hand experiments not to say, look, I've got a third hand but instead to think that their real hand has somehow become transformed into the rubber hand, so they only, have, they only have the right number of hands. And that's what you find. And Matt Longo, I was at a conference with him last week in, in Copenhagen on, on bodily awareness, and confirmed that the studies that, that he did and published in 2008, a recurrent theme 
of subjects in the rubber hand illusion is that they experience the rubber hand as somehow being absorbed into their own, into their own bodies. And it's interesting that if it's not possible for them to absorb the rubber hand into their own bodies, if it's not possible for them to represent this rubber hand as part of their own bodies, then you don't get the illusion. So if that's the rubber hand, and it's there on my right hand side, it has to be a right hand. If you put a left hand there, and you stroke it, and you do all the stuff that normally generates the illusion, you don't get the illusion. So anatomical plausibility has to be in place, and I think that's kind of what boundedness suggests. And I think connectedness, you also see this being borne out by the rubber hand illusion. So if you've got the wrong kind of posture, you don't get the illusion. So if your hand is at that kind of angle, but the rubber hand is at that angle, you, you don't get the illusion. And in essence, I think that's because your, the rest of your body is telling you, you have the connectedness information from your elbow, which is telling you that your body's, your hand must be, your lower arm must be pointing in a certain direction, but what you see is dissonant with that, clashes with it. So if connectedness wasn't the case, you wouldn't expect to see this effect. You have anatomical viability, but you don't actually have postural viability, and connectedness suggests that what you experience is your limb within the context of your entire body. So the, the fake hand, the rubber hand, has to be consistent with how the rest of your body is, is configured. So here's the problem that I want to tackle. It's explaining how we experience space within our bodies in a way that explains those two features, boundedness and connectedness. So just some more housekeeping. So here's how I'm going to use language. Bodily space is, for most of us, what's inside the skin. For some of us, it extends beyond that. For others of us, it's a little bit more restricted than that. There's also cognitive scientists, particularly those working on motor control, emphasize that there's what they call peripersonal space. So the space around the body that's within reach is represented in different ways for the distant space, space that's, space that's out of reach. So a very nice example of this comes from patients with spatial neglect. So if you ask patients with spatial neglect, if you draw a whole bunch of lines like this, and you ask patients with spatial neglect, who would neglect the left-hand side, bisect all the lines that you can see. This is what they'll do. And then they'll stop, because they're neglecting this whole side of space. If you say to them, take this laser pointer and bisect all the lines that you can see over there, they'll go right the way across. So the neglect that they experience is neglect within reaching space, within peripersonal space. I think that marks the, the distinction kind of nicely. Forget about this imagined space. So remember what, what, we're, what we're talking about, what I'm talking about, are frames of reference. How we represent space. What's the coordinate system? What's the origin? What are the axes? So when people write about peripersonal space, they write about it as having, they study it as having representation of peripersonal space as taking, involving lots of extrinsic frames of reference, depending on the modality. So when you represent things within reaching distance visually, typically your frame of reference is, has its origin in your eyes, in your, in your retina. When you represent extrapersonal space through smell or through hearing, then the coordinate system typically has its origin in your head. Neurophysiological studies on macaque monkeys have shown that there are receptive fields in the premotor cortex in monkeys 
that are sensitive to regions of space around the hand. So the receptive field moves with the hand. So the neurons will fire when something takes place around the hand, irrespective of whether the hand is here or the hand is there. But this doesn't really get at what I want to talk about, because if you say that you've got a location that's experienced or coded on a hand-centered frame of reference, that just means that you've got a location on a coordinate system whose origin is the hand. But what I want to know is, how do we experience the hand? How do we experience the location of the hand in space, from the inside? How does proprioception, how do bodily sensations, how does touch tell us where our hand is, or our foot, or our knee, or whatever? Choose your favorite body part. So here's one approach. And as I said, people haven't thought about this, to the best of my knowledge, because what people typically assume is what I'm calling the Cartesian approach. Let me just emphasize, this is not Cartesian in the sense in which Cartesian is always bad. This is Cartesian in the sense in which we have Cartesian coordinates. So the idea is that you apply to the body the same way of thinking about space that you apply to objects in the external world. So you think about it as a Cartesian coordinate system. There's an origin. The origin is on the body's center of gravity, center of mass. And there are three dimensions. The sagittal plane, the transverse plane across, and the frontal plane down the side. So like an X, a Y, and a Z axis. And I think one advantage of so the idea that is experiencing a bodily event at a particular body location is experiencing it at a certain point given by on a coordinate system that is relative to an origin in the body's center of, center of gravity. And what this means is that the space of the body is very continuous with peripersonal space. So it's really easy to map between the, between the two of them. How are we doing for time? I have had 45 or I have 45? I make it 35. 20 minutes? Okay, so, okay, that, that's enough. So, let me just quickly give you three problems with this view. So, if you think about space being represented like this, there's a point here at the body's center of, center of mass that is the origin. But if you think about how you experience things in your body, this whole notion of an origin doesn't seem to make sense. If you think about a visual frame of reference, you experience things in the world as being in a certain, as being in a certain place, egocentrically relative to a position, the origin of the field of the origin of the field of view. But your experience of your own body doesn't have a place that counts as me in the way that the origin of the field of view counts as me. And if you, again, if you represent space in that Cartesian way, there's no difference between bodily space and peripersonal space. So there's no difference between a point here in between my fingers and a point inside my fingers. But that seems to conflict with the boundedness idea. It makes space on the Cartesian view completely homogeneous. And then finally, if connectedness is right, when you experience a bodily event, say a pain in your knee, you experience it relative to the spatial layout of the whole of your body. But that's not the case on the Cartesian view because it's just a coordinate. It carries no information about the rest of the, the, rest of the body. So here in a nutshell is the basic alternative that I want to press. So, Think about the frame of reference for bodily experience by working backwards from motor control. So think about the requirements of action, and then think how do we need to experience our bodies in order for action to be possible. So here are four things 
that you need to be able to compute in order to act. You need to know where the target is. And you need to know where the target is on an external frame of reference. You need to know where your effectors are. If, it's, if you're going to kick something, you need to know where your foot is. If you're going to reach out to something, you need to know where your hand is. And you need to know that in terms of where, how your joints are, how your joints are, are disposed. You need to know how to, what the trajectory is from here to here. And you need to know how you generate torque in your joints, using your muscles and your tendons in order to achieve that movement. So you need to do all of these four things. And what I want to highlight are the angles, the joint angles, and the joint torques. Because I think thinking about bodily, bodily representation in terms of the articulation of the human body is the key to what's distinctive about it. Let's get this. So I want to. Oh, well, I can't skip. So, very quickly, two ways of thinking about a body location. So, think about something that's going on in your hand. In your hand. Just thinking about it at a particular place in an abstract representation of your body. Or you can think about it in terms of not just that it's in your hand, but it's in the hand as located at the end of your arm, which is disposed in a certain way relative to your shoulder, which is disposed in a certain way. So I'm going to call these A location and B location. And I want to, one thing I want to emphasize is that these can come apart. So you can have patients with damage to their peripheral nervous system, a very small number of patients, but they show consistent behavior, where what you find is that they can't locate an event in their body where it actually is in space. So if you present one of those patients, they have no sensation in their arm, you, pre you present them a stimulus, they can feel some active touch, you touch them on their hand where they can't see it, and then say, reach, reach to where you are being touched. Hopeless. I can't do it. Then you say, here's a, here's a map of the human body. Point on this map to where you're being touched. Then they get it right. So they can touch the location, they can identify the location on an abstract map of the body, but they can't coordinate their coordinate action to it. So that's A location coming apart from B location. So what I want to propose is that we experience the body as a torso, it typically doesn't move, connected by joints to movable body parts. And what those joints do is give you the possibility of movement. And those joints provide the fixed points relative to which we can think about bodily locations. So if you think about pain in your hand, the A location of that is given in a coordinate system that's based on the wrist. The B location is given by that, that coordinate in the wrist, in the hand, and then the disposition of the wrist, the angle, in three dimensions. The elbow in two, two degrees of freedom and the shoulder in, in, in three degrees of freedom. So you have a, a kind of... You're experiencing the body as an articulated structure. You can see here all the, all the, all the joints. So in the last few minutes, what I want to do is just explain, if you think about the body in this very gen general way, how you can flesh that out in a way that will give you a model of how the space of the body is represented in experience. And I think, as I said before, you can draw on two complementary ideas in, in cognitive science. So I'm interested in, in sporting activities for various reasons. 
And one of the things that I've spent some time looking at is biomechanics and how in kinesiology, people who study movement represent the movement of, of, of body parts, how they study athletes, studying efficiency, efficiency of movement. And you see the same problems grappled with by people in robotics. How do you represent how a robot is disposed in such a way that you can kind of write equations that will help that robot solve, solve problems? And what you see in both biomechanics and robotics is a basic picture of the body, of the robot or of the athlete, as rigid links that are connected by mechanical joints. So that's one, one piece of the puzzle. And I think the other piece of the puzzle, if you think back to students of cognitive science and object perception here, think back to Mara Nishihara's work on, on visual object recognition, the idea that all objects in the human body in particular can be viewed as hierarchies of, of generalized cones. So I'm going to put these two ideas together to explain A location, the experience of A location, the experience of B location. So this is a famous picture from Mar Nishihara's 1978 paper. So you can see here the idea of a hierarchy of cylinders. So at the level of abstraction, the whole human body is just one big cylinder. Articulated, then you've got a cylinder, the torso, a cylinder at the head, and this big long cylinder here that's the arm. But that can be broken down into two cylinders connected at the elbow. And then the forearm can be broken down into one cylinder connected to the hand, and then the hand, and you've got two knuckle joints in each finger, so you can continue the cylinders. So when I said the... Let me see what's next. Ooh, that's scary. Let's stay with this one just for a little bit. So the... What I call A location is location inside a cylinder. So if you experience something in your forearm, Think about that as being located in a cylinder that's connected to your elbow in a frame of reference that's centered on your elbow. If you think about it like that, you can use a sort of basically cylindrical coordinate system to give you a representation of where that location is. So think about that as being the center of, the center of gravity of your forearm. Then that will allow you to plot regions in the in, in the cylinder. Spot, plot, give a coordinate specifying the location of things in the, in the cylinder that's your forearm. And then I borrowed this diagram from a textbook on, on, uh, on kinesiology. And you see here how you can represent the whole disposition of a body in terms of the angles of the joints that connected up. So if you think about a pain in your ankle. It's got an A location in that cylinder on cylindrical coordinates relative to that cylinder, and then the B location, the total disposition of the body, is given by spelling out the angles of all the relevant of all the relevant um, all the relevant joints. Human. You know, if you're an enthusiast of this sort of stuff, then you can see how. If you're, if you're interested in kinesiology, you're not interested, or robotics, you're not interested in what goes on inside the upper leg or inside the lower leg. So you represent these as if they're just sort of, just bits of stuff. But what the cylindrical idea allows you to do is to think of these as regions of space within which you can locate further events. So here where you've got the, a reference frame on the, on, the femur, on the femur and another one on the tibia, that from, from the point of view of a kinesiologist, these are just two solid links. If you think about them, if you use the Ma Nishihara way of thinking about them as cylinders, and you think about location within those cylinders, then you can see these as regions of space that events can take place inside of. So that's actually all I want pretty much all I want to say, which is that... So I started out with this idea that there's something very distinctive about how we experience our bodies. And I wanted to... That's reflected in the ownership stuff that we find in the rubber hand illusion, full body illusion, and so on. 
And the proposal I want to throw out is that we experience the space of the body in a very different way from how we experience objects outside the body. So not on a single reference frame centered in an origin at the body's center of mass. But instead we can think about it in a way that's much more like a system of, of links connected up by joints where we look at each of those links as kind of a little, a little cylinder. Now, this may be false, but as far as I know, it's the only proposal in the literature that is an alternative to the Cartesian one. So I would just throw it out there because it will probably get us, maybe it may get us a little closer to the, to the truth. So what, what I want to propose then is that the ownership of our bodies comes because we experience them in a very distinctive way from a spatial point of view. The spatial frame of reference for bodily events is very different from the frame of reference for things in the outside world. That's why one of the very, that's a key explanation for why we experience our bodies is different. Then I'm going to counter why that's the case. The account might be true, might be false, but I think it's a great starting point for a discussion. So, thank you. Thank you very much for an interesting lecture. And now it's time for your questions. So, I'm wondering if you could say a little bit more about the way in which you think that this cylindrical model or the uh, grounds, and this is a word that you use, grounds, uh, I guess our experience of action. And, I mean, what's the relationship there? Because it isn't clear to me how that works. So. So start, start with this one. So, so the idea was that what we experience is our body is an articulated in terms of joints. Now, if you think about experiencing your body as, take a sort of phrase you find in Husserl, as a potentiality for action. Sounds good. What does that mean? Here, here's a hypothesis. This is, here's a hypothesis. I'm not a Husserl scholar. But the hypothesis means that what you experience is there are certain movements you can make and certain movements that you can't make. Now, the way in which I can put content to that is through the thought that for these joints, there are certain, each one of them has a certain number of degrees of freedom. So your knee, for example, can move up and down. And it can't move past a certain degree of hyperextension. So you can put numbers in to that from the third person perspective, but from the first person perspective, you can experience that your knee has a certain range of possible motions. And that's what I think, that's the connection with, with well that's one of the connections with, with action. So the other one is, again, consider a reaching action. So you want to reach to pick that up. So you need to encode the location of it. But the actual movement, the motor commands, are instructions to your shoulder, not so much, your elbow, a lot, and your hands as to how to make a movement that will reach out and your torso, because I need to, to bend over. Now, really, what that is, is essentially a computation on joint angles and an instruction to muscles to generate the amount of torque that will, that will basically make that computation, realize that computation, that will take you from the starting point to the end point. Go. May I, may I just um, but the, this is at the level of the motor command, right? Right. So, right. And I thought what you're talking about was the level of phenomenology. So Correct. The way that it appears to us, right? So it isn't, it isn't obvious, at least in what you said, how those two things are going to come together. I mean, motor commands are probably the sorts of things that are never going to become conscious. I mean, I can't even, right? So how are they going to inform the way that our body appears to us from the first person point of view? Okay, I mean, I think that, that's, that absolutely gets to the heart, the heart of the issue. So my assumption Maybe it's a hidden assumption, but I think, I think I made it explicit, or maybe in a slightly oblique way, is that the way in which we experience our bodies is 
on a par with the way in which we need to represent them in, in motor control. So just as you might think that the way in which we, the, the, the way in which the motor system encodes a target location reflects the fact that we see it, it's on the same frame of reference. My hypothesis, and that's all it is, is that we experience our bodies in terms of those, those very variables that need to be specified in order to make action possible. Now, from a cognitive science perspective, you sometimes get a dissonance between what goes on at the subpersonal action level and what goes on at the, at the conscious level. So the two visual systems hypothesis is the, the most obvious example of that, the idea that what we see, action for seeing and identification is not the same as, as sorry, vision for identification, conscious vision for identification is not the same as vision for action. So I'm assuming that this is, that is not the case here. That got, that got a go. Good. <laughs> Am I correct in thinking that what you say is that there is boundary of connectedness in the fundamental world in the experience of ownership? Yes. So imagine an experiment in which you use a cover device that, may, that allows you to control the movement of an external object as if by telekinesis, and you also sense some physical events in this object. And so you might use it as if it was your own link as a right. process device. And also certain interesting things could happen. For example, you could have a wall or some uh, clear obstacle and you would still control this object. I would uh, imagine that uh, in this case, I would feel that this object is part of my body. This is a strong right? And at the same time, I would say it is connected or bounded in the same way as the rest of my body is. I mean, I would feel a gap in some way, some fundamental way. Like it's like a deep create of two parts. I just imagine. Like, so, so wait a minute. So this is, so this is kind of like a prosthetic, but a prosthetic yes. that's not attached to you. Yes, it's so it's like a remote control prosthetic. Yes, maybe a draw, for example. Right. Yeah. So. And you have something like I don't know, clever EG device or something like right? you can steer at least uh, reasonably well how this device is flying through the air and maybe see the picture in your uh, in your. So I think that's a really interesting question, and we were kind of talking about something not a million miles away over lunch when we were talking about the extended mind hypothesis. But, so I don't know anyone who's investigated that experimentally, but here are two things that are kind of relevant. One is the experience of drone pilots. So the guys that sit in Texas and pilot the drones that kill people in, in, in Iraq and, and, and Syria. And whatever you think about the ethics of that, I think from a cognitive science point of view, it's interesting to think about how they might, how that kind of displacement yeah, would, yeah. Would, would, would affect their, their body image. I mean, my prediction is that they would, so I think what I would say, yeah, what, what I would say is that probably what they would do is experience an extension of themselves with some bizarre story about how there really is some kind of connectedness there. And let me explain to you why I say that. So there's, there's an illusion called the invisible hand illusion, which is basically like the rubber hand illusion, but there's no hand. So what people experience is basically really a sensation out in space. But they call it the invisible hand illusion because what they experience is their hand is a hand out in space. So what I take from that is that when you get in these kind of weird situations where it looks as if there's unconnectedness, you, you basically confabulate connectedness. I have this impression that the way you develop this idea of space, of the body space, it's all based on the uh, of how it serves to the cultural perception of you know, right. the whole place. And this idea of was going to be developed by the, in quite detail by Sutton and Barton. They do, uh, by Sutton and Barton, in their uh, reinforcement and learning framework in the early 90s. You know, because they had to deal with the problem of how to define the boundaries of an abstract agent. So they're trying to deal with the kind of agent space. So what would they say about the, about the drones? They said that 
it contains the, uh, the body of an agent full of the abstract terms. It's, uh, it's limited by the limits of control. And, and they have a pretty nice idea in my view of how to define the limits of control. But it wasn't about the experience because it was right. a classroom. No, I think there are definitely some there are definitely some parallels there, yeah. and I think the the, the 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 idea that the limits of the self are given by the limits of control, definitely. The idea the other way that the limits of control might give the limits of the self is not not so obvious to me. Mm. It'd have to be you'd really have to build it up a long way before the drone. Yeah. <laughs> but but these guys spend eight hours a day just yeah. Yeah. pretending to be a drone. Yeah. So who knows what goes on. There. Yeah. Uh, thank you for a great talk. Uh, I need to admit that I'm still not very convinced that your proposition is able to explain fully what, how exact ownership uh, towards our body parts in general are part of the So I have some question that you could uh, explain in terms of your theory how these disturbances of uh, ownership toward uh, kind of body arises in, the, in, for example, in somewhat paraphernalia and in rapid resolution. So if you can explain it in this. In yeah. Terms of I mean, let, so let me just step back and just give you some methodology first. So I think one has to be. So right at the beginning, I said that I had some reservations about how ownership is studied in cognitive science, because ownership is often taken to be that thing, whatever it is, that is manipulated in the rubber hand illusion. And I think I have, some, I have some kind of reservations about that, that way of thinking about things. Because I think sometimes when you operationalize something, the operationalization takes on a life of its own. So let me give you an example from an, another area of cognitive science that I've worked in, which is reason. I mean, I read, a, I read a book a year or two ago that purported to be a theory of reason. But when you looked at it, it really wasn't a theory of reason. It was a theory of the waste and selection task. And the waste and selection task is useful for operationalizing certain facts about how we use conditionals, but it doesn't really capture the phenomenon that we're trying to capture with, with, with the theory of reasoning. And I think the same thing holds in, in this area. The rubber hand illusion is kind of interesting, and it points us in the, towards a phenomenon, but it doesn't exhaust that phenomenon. So I say that just by way of of explaining that I'm trying, to do, I'm trying to address a phenomenon that's really, in a sense, more basic than the rubber hand illusion. The rubber hand illusion points to it, but it doesn't point to it in its entirety. Because no one really believes that the rubber hand is their hand. I mean, if you look at the, at the reports of, of the, the Longo and others have, have given, it's, there's a real dissonance. I mean, they feel as if there's a sensation in their hand. They feel as if it's their hand. But no sane person thinks that the rubber hand is their hand. So there isn't really, a, what I'm trying to say is that there isn't really a full-fledged illusion of ownership there. But if I can answer, what, what you can ask as much as you like. Yeah. And also, for example, out of body illusion, which is quite popular in terms of people who suffering from epileptic seizures. Yeah. So how do you I mean, so much of paraphrenia. So, I mean, the other, there's a lot going on in these patients. You know, they really are not, they're not in a good way. And taking the, you know, you have, what I'm saying is you have to be very careful about interpreting the language here. So, when people say, you know, I can feel a sensation in, in this arm, but it's not my arm. You know, I mean, I, you know, back in the day, Wittgenstein would say they can't make any sense out of that. Well, I can make some sense out of that, but I'm really struggling to think my way into the experience of someone for whom that could be, a, as it were, a phenomenological reality. So all of this is by way of saying, really what I'm trying to address is giving an account that would work for you and would work for me of why we feel a certain intimate relationship to this physical object, but not to another one. And that will maybe suggest some things about rubber hand and suggest some things about neuropsychological patients, but without, I don't take it to, to be a requirement that I have to give a full, full explanation of what goes on there, because those cases are just weird. Yeah, I'm asking not without purpose, because I've got a feeling that uh, in your theory, just mostly focus on the kind of 
skeleton and the surface of the body. Right. But there is like emptiness inside. So what I'm, what I'm thinking about is are these new theories about visceral um, mm -hmm. kind of base, basis of uh, proto self and pre reflective self experience, which are pretty pretty popular, like even Damaso's pro proto self or neuro subjective frame Great. of Adam Bondry and stuff like this. How your theory deals with this? So, so, I, so I like that question. So the visceral stuff is what happens inside the cylinder. Yeah, exactly. So if you... There. Here we go. If you go back to this and you think about this kind of frame of reference, a three-dimensional di three, three space centered on, on you know, wherever your, your center of mass is, I think there's no way of picking out what's inside the skin, what's visceral, and what's outside the skin. Whereas if you think that something like that gives the, gives the picture of how you experience our bodies, there is a sense in which you've got a structure that has an inside. And so you can locate events inside it on a coordinate system that might, might look like that. So I think you can capture that that aspect of it in there. The problem is that we can't totally feel the spatial location of our visceral experiences, so it's quite impossible in terms of, uh, of you know, it's, it's simply implausible in the physical field. Well, well, hang on, so, so what's implausible? That we can give a specific point? Yeah, we can't. Correct. But that we can feel a region? I'm not a complete expert in this, I don't know, but as but far as I know, we can have kind of illusions of like sort of sheets, uh, like in which, like the way we experience like some visceral experiences. But yeah, I'm adding, I'm adding all this visceral stuff because I've got a feeling that ownership is what you just said, that you've got some kind of feeling toward this. It's not just about the spatial location, spatial experience, right. but that feeling kind of comes off. I would, I would guess that experience of ownership is kind of combination of the spatial location and all, all your theory plus my kind of emotional uh, approach toward this region which is more for like a visceral experience emotion yeah I mean no I, th I think that's great and I, th I think we're probably saying the same thing just with slightly different emphases because what you're what you're proposing is something that sounds a little bit closer to that view from Locke that I started at the beginning so this the I love these pointers Well, I had a lot of slides. So this, this view here, the, the thinking conscious self, all the parts of the body that we feel when they're touched and are affected by unconscious of good or harm that happens to them. You know, 17th century English, but I think that conveys kind of what you're saying. And I don't want to dispute that, I just want to say let's think about how, what, what's distinctive about the space of those, about the spatiality of those feelings and what the, the frame of reference. Yeah. Uh, I was wondering, do you think uh, there is any chance of uh, <clears throat> using <clears throat> some more permanent illusions like this, for example, these drone panels, let's say, to uh, train people, for example, sportsmen, to somehow extend their physical abilities? Do you think there is a potential? If you're exposed, for example, for eight hours to an image of yourself or your hand is actually longer, or maybe it's made of rubber, and you can extend more. And then after the experiment is finished, uh, still applying the, the, the natural limits of your hand, maybe you can, for example, run faster or reach faster. That's maybe really interesting. <coughs> so I have no idea. But what I can say is that the... So as I mentioned to you, I'm interested in, in kinesiology stuff for, for a range of reasons, not all of which have to do with my day job. But the... The literature in kinesiology and biomechanics, if you look at a standard textbook, cognitive science is completely absent from it. I mean, the, the, the level of, of sophistication that you've just suggested is, is not, not yet out there in the literature. I'm not saying that these are unsophisticated people, but they just haven't thought about how to connect up with this literature from, from cognitive science. So I think that would be a really exciting way to go. I mean, there is there's anecdotal evidence and I choose that word advisedly on the use of visualization 
in, in, in sport. Mm -hmm. And to, from my own experience, it's, it's, a, it's, a, good, it's a good tool. Um, but that's not, the use of that tool is basically, it's grounded in practice. I mean, it's worked. There's no theoretical, as far as I know, there's no theoretical justification or basis behind it. So that I see a, a, a huge unexplored area there for cognitive science of sporting performance. Yeah. I just want, uh, you said that you did not believe it was this distinct feeling of kindness, but we have judgments of uh, right. So would you say is <laughs> just a good question? And um, when we encounter someone who says that uh, okay, this is not my hand or this is this part of my body is to just not belong to my body or something like that. So would you say that we can say to this person that your judgment is wrong? Or no, or no, or, uh, or do you feel that this um, this ground and the subjective experience of the body is just final? So do do you have to accept that this person is just right because this is the experience of the body that this person has? So can you say it's no? I, so there raises some some really interesting questions that I think dovetail with the with with the earlier question yes, from really from here because I think. Looking at these things from a philosophical perspective, it's kind of, it's easy to be, that there's a danger of being too glib. And I'll just say that I have, I take, run the risk of being too glib. So you, you basically take some words and you take them at face value and you interpret them accordingly. But when you start to look more closely or when you talk to people that work with these patients, you see that the reality is so much more nuanced. So there are all sorts of ways in which patients who say, this is not my hand, act as if it's their hand. I mean, there, there isn't a unitary lack of, lack of ownership. And then you look at some of the transcripts of interviews, and you see the kind of contortions that people get into to try and make sense of their own experience. And that's, I think that's the really the key thing here, which is that in, in these kind of bodily disorders, and in many psychiatric disorders, you've got an experiential weirdness. I mean, you, your experience of this hand just is missing some kind of affective component that experience of the rest of your body has. And that just throws up this dissonance that you try and make sense of in all sorts of ways. Just as on some interpretations of schizophrenia, the, the experience of the mechanism that attributes, that allows you to identify, subpersonally to identify actions as yours is missing. And that throws up anomalies in experience, and some of the delusions that people get into um, ways can be seen as ways of trying to confabulate themselves out of that. So to respond exactly to your question, no, it doesn't typically saying, yes, you're right, isn't the right response, because they don't even believe that they're right. But saying that, no, you're wrong, doesn't help either, because they, they, you can't take away from them that, that real deep sense of, of, of anomaly. Less about you know, typical situations you can get into, but it was more about uh, how you conceive of the relation between uh, you know these subpersonal mechanism and the conscious assessment of what is happening. And this is what was actually I was getting to. Right. So do do you think that typically um, it should work like that that there's a subpersonal mechanism, this subpersonal double framework, and it usually it just works and it's okay. And sometimes we would have this needs there's a strange need for it, we can just draw on this double framework and say, oh, okay, this experience will took part in my left hand, it was here, and everything is all right. So do you think it's just, uh, is there a, do you think that, that the judgment itself has you know, two components? One is more conscious, perhaps, and the other one <coughs> is just basic and normally is not really uh, articulated in, in any way. So do we have like two kinds of judgments of what uh, Yeah, so you may... So here, based on means both derived by and justified by, mm -hmm. and I think that that, in a sense, that two-sidedness is exactly the point that you're, the, the, that you're highlighting here. So in a causal sense, there's a whole 
mechanism that will generate a judgment of ownership and that will have some personal level things and some, some personal level things. When you shift to the, the sort of normative question of, well, what justifies it? You know, if we were having a discussion about is it rational or is it irrational, is it well-founded or ill-founded, then you'd be typically focusing more on the, on the conscious experiential aspects. But the reason I was saying that you can get into all these troubles is because those two things are interacting all the time. And that's what makes the, you know, that's what makes these patients hard to study. It doesn't exactly how they interact. Right. So the, so the answer, I think, is that, the, as it were, the personal level, the personal level discourse, as it were, is the, is the, is the normative one. But that intersects in, in many different ways with the, with the subpersonal ones in, in a way that it's not always easy to separate them separate them out. So a, a long time ago I published a paper on, on the, dis, the distinction between the personal and subpersonal level, essentially trying to make that, make that point, which is that although you know, Dennett and a whole bunch of people have suggested that there are sort of two different, almost autonomous domains of, of explanation, domains of discourse, actually they're really inter, interdigitated. Mm -hmm. So I guess that one reason why I haven't thought much about that is that it doesn't seem to me that you can make the same distinction between bodily time and external time that you can make between bodily space and external space. So if, if what I say is true, then, then there's pretty drastic difference between the coordinates between the bodily coordinate system and the the inward the inwardly directed bodily coordinate system and the outwardly directed coordinate system. But I, I don't see it. Maybe this is just lack of lack of vision. Metaphorical vision. But there's a similar similar disanalogy in the time sense. So, so let's throw that back to you. Wow, so I mean it seems like there's there's a whole set of reasons to think that there's such a dis distinction, right? I mean, so there's a okay. way to, there's a there there's a way in which you know um, I may experience my body or what is happening to me in time that is distinct from the way that the world is experienced, right? So, for example, when I'm listening to a talk, time might go by really quickly, and I'm embodied in that ex experience, even though I also know. And experience your talk as la as lasting, say, one hour. Oh, okay, so, right, but that's a different distinction. So, I think that what you're just pointing to now is that there's a difference between how you experience time and some objective measure sure. of time. Sure. So, you know, you flatter me. I suspect that time goes really slowly when I'm talking. It's just like, I can't wait this thing ever ends. But the 
the, that's not a difference between your bodily time inside your body and time outside your body, which is the. But it seems that your actions are going to be sent to be sent to be sensitive to one to one of these. So whatever just, your sub subjective experience is like, right? You can still cat calls and click click and clickers in the right way. So there's a distinction. But that that suggests that your body's attuned to real time, as it were, not not your subjective perception of time. That somehow the subjective perception of time is is in here, but it's not reflected in your in your motor control. No, I but I think, but there, I think you're right. <laughs> there could be. I mean, you, you could actually. I mean, you can study this. I mean, you could just put people in some really boring. I mean, I could read out my collected works to people, for example, and then you could look and see how they how they walk out of the room. So, do they walk in a in in a slightly slower way? I mean, it doesn't right. need to be exaggerated, but you might find, as you sometimes find with people with depression, for example, that their their movements, the right. the, the the contours of their movements change as a function of their you know, whether they're in a down or, or an up. And absolutely, you might find the same thing with, that's correlated with perceptions of time. But again, I'm not sure that, I'm not sure that that's been studied. Hmm. I'm pretty sure it hasn't. So, so you don't think there's a bodily time in this, in this way, that time or the temporal component of our actions plays a role in this experience? I think that, I think the bodies whose time is disconnected from the environment they may have existed, but evolution took care of them. I mean, there's a serious point there. I mean, you, need to, you need to be able to coordinate your actions mm -hmm. with, with, with external events. And in a sense, what I was trying to say about the space of the body was that that way of representing space inside the body makes it easier for you to act, not harder. Well, there is a small phenomenon that perhaps is uh, like more in Nihau's uh, way. I think intentional timing is something like um, the sort of religion we've been looking for, that the way we uh, seem to perceive our um, events as closer to our actions if we think that it is our actions that cause them. And uh, although objectively we uh, objectively go this is right. larger, then we think that it was like, closer to our action because I was the agent here. I think this is something that may suggest some kind of uh, in terms of time frame, perhaps very, very much oriented on our motor actions and things like that. Wouldn't that actually suggest a more of a harmony between perception of outside time and and bodily events? Whereas I think that what what was being suggested was that there might be a, a, a disanalogy in the time analogous to the disanalogy in space. I mean, I think that's a great example. Man. Similar to, to the way you distinguish experience body from the body. Right. So we have experience actions and experience like part of the world and we act upon from the world of Interesting. Good. Thank you for your lecture again. Yeah. Well, thanks for some great questions. We really appreciate it. Thank you for the questions and the discussion. And let's send this to the